Good morning. We'd like to welcome everyone, those of you here and those of you worshiping online, to the worship service of the Lighthouse Methodist Church here on Boca Grande, where we continue to receive the light, be the light, and share the light of Jesus Christ. A special welcome to any first-time visitors. We ask that you complete the Connect card in the back of the bulletin and place it in the offering plate on your way as, as we pass the plate. Um, we have a small gift for you in the narthex as you depart. We hope you'll come back and worship with us again soon. We are a congregation that believes in the power of prayer. If, you have a, if you'd like a pastoral visit or if you have a prayer request, we ask that you indicate that on the Connect card as well. For announcements today, um, I'd like to let you know that we have raised more than enough to put a deposit down on our organ. That's amazing. Thank you all so much. We are about $20,000 short, so we're still looking to make up that small amount. And hopefully soon we'll have a brand new organ here for Philip to um, play for us. Um, I'd like to let you know also on October 8th, Philip is bringing in a brass quintet to play a Sunday of brass for us. They'll have a fine selection of music, and it's going to be an amazing Sunday. I invite all of you to come and worship with us on that special day. On this Wednesday begins Reverend Daphne's Bible study here at church or on Zoom. You can contact the office if you need a book or if you're interested in joining. And um, I also was in touch with Gene Steinman. I want to let you know we are going to do the shoebox ministry again at Christmas for kids' needs. So I will keep you posted with updates on that as they come through. And that concludes the announcement portion of the service. With the chiming of the Trinity, let us quiet our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship. Good morning. Let us join together in our call to worship. The Spirit's presence is among us in this sacred place. It causes our hearts to stir, our minds to create, and our voices to rise in joyful praise and celebration. Stand. Let us pray. 
Lord of all, you sent your spirit to be the life and power of your church. So in our hearts, the seeds of your grace and love for this world. Fill us with your spirit so that we might go forth in mission and ministry to the world and bring glory to your holy name. Amen. seated. I'd like to invite the young people to join me. I was so excited to see my friends this morning. I'm so glad you're here. How's your week been? Pretty good? Good. Who likes Oreos? <laughs> Me! <laughs> I brought Oreos today. What's your favorite part of the Oreos? I like the cream inside. The cream inside? The the, oh, the cookies? The creamy inside, most people like the creamy part inside. But boy, when you go to the store, you can't just buy that creamy stuff, can you? You got to buy the whole Oreos. And so look, I got this package here of Oreos. It comes in the box. You've got to get into the box. And then you got the packages. And you got to get into the packages. And sometimes it's hard. And inside there are the cookies. And so you got to get into the cookies, and here's the cookies, and then do you twist them and get them apart to eat the inside? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Oops. And there's the creamy inside, the part that we've been waiting for. But we got to work to get there, don't we? we got to go through all this stuff in order to get to those creamy centers. So when we get into the Wild Center today, we're going to talk about the parable of the treasures. And so I kind of think of the creamy inside of the Oreos as our treasure. And the Bible tells us that when we work to get to our treasures in heaven, we got to work to get there, right? We go through life. We have our experiences in life. Some of them are great things. We get a lot of blessings in life. But sometimes things get a little bit difficult. But it's okay because God's getting us ready for our treasures that we're going to find in heaven. Just like the creamy center of the Oreos, we've got heaven to look forward to, and that's our, our treasure. And so we'll talk about more of that when we get into the, um, into the wild center. But let me read to you out of the Psalms here. And here's what it says. Just like our Oreos, it says, How sweet your words taste to me. They're sweeter than honey and Oreos. Your command commandments give me understanding, no wonder I hate every false way of life. So if we look to the truth and we look to that creamy center of life and all of the wonderful things that God provides for us, we're going to find that treasure on the inside. And we'll talk about that more when we get there. But let's pray first, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us every day. We thank you for this new day and all the things that are to come 
between now and the time we go to bed. We know that you will be there every step of the way to guide us, to help us, and to give us all of those treasures and the creamy centers that you offer us in life. And we thank you for that, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Should we take our Oreos and go to the Wild Center? Yes. yes. All right, let's do that. I'll even take the crumbs. <laughs> Let us pray together the prayer for illumination. Guide us, gracious God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from a letter of Paul to the Philippians. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked 
and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, it's really not fair for Kathy to tease everybody with Oreos and then take them out, and now you're looking at me. <laughs> no treats today. <laughs> so as I was um, getting preparing the other day, I was reading something, and I found the following. It made me stop and think. When you stand at the pearly gates, would you rather be told that you believed too much or you believed too little? Would you stand at the pearly gates? Would you rather be told that you cared too much or that you cared too little? Would you rather, when you stand at the pearly gates, yes, would you rather be told that you tried too hard or that you didn't try hard enough? And when you stand at the pearly gates, would you rather be told that you were too forgiving or that you were too judgmental? When you stand at the pearly gates, would you rather be told, well done, thou hope, hyper hopeful risk-taking servant, or well done, thou so sober and play it safe servant? <laughs> and I think most of all of us would rather answer that we would prefer to be told we believe too much, that we cared too much, that we tried too hard, that we forgave too many I believe that we would rather see ourselves as hope-filled and risk-taking servants of Christ. But I think the most important question here is, are we? Are we hope-filled risk-takers for Christ? Or are we someone that wants to play it safe? We don't want to be put out too much. We want to be careful. And if we believe too much we may be open to ridicule. If we care too much, then we might make ourselves vulnerable to hurt and pain. If we try too hard and we waste our time and our energies, we may just find out that whatever it was wasn't really worth our energy. If we forgive too much, 
We could be seen as patsies, someone who's just easily manipulated and easily used. If we hope too much, if we risk too much, we might just be disappointed and lose it all. You see, these are the challenges of Christian discipleship. We discussed some of this on September 3rd when we discussed cheap grace. We cannot be part-time disciples. It doesn't work. A Christian disciple is someone who follows Christ, who tries to live their lives modeled after the teachings of Jesus Christ, and then who seeks to lead others to live their lives as followers of Christ as well. When Jesus called his disciples to follow him, he never said, hey, guys, this is going to be easy. There's a contemporary song that I like, and it highlights what it means to be a true disciple. It's called, I Will Follow. I want you to listen to some of the lyrics. Light unto the world, light unto my life. I will live for you alone. You are the one I seek, knowing I will find All I need is you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Now this is true discipleship. Giving your all to Christ alone. As those who are now called to be followers of Christ, we should not be looking for the easy path. As I said, it does not exist. So, then how do we do this? How do we know how to live our lives of faithful commitment? Well, we're lucky. We have the Apostle Paul who has given us some guidance in our text this morning on how to live a life worthy of the gospel. Now, fortunately, in our journey along this path, we are not alone. There are many that have gone on before us. We have a lot of really good company, starting with the Apostle Paul. And not only was Paul a great preacher and a great teacher, he was also a great pastor, especially to the churches that he established along his way. And one such church was located in Philippi, a major city in northern Greece, He had established this church at a much earlier date, perhaps around 50 CE. But he is writing this letter, the letter that we now have in our New Testament from prison, approximately 10 years later as he's awaiting his trial before Emperor Nero. Now this would have been now around 59 or 60 CE. And he's writing to the community of Philippi in response to a visit from Epaphroditus, who had just come from Philippi and was to return to them shortly. And Paul is writing to thank them for the gifts that they sent for him and also to set his imprisonment as well as their situation into a larger context. His words of comfort and of encouragement in the face of adversity can serve us well today just as they did the community of Philippi 2,000 years ago. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, evidently, just as Paul was suffering imprisonment, the Philippians were undergoing some kind of challenge. And what this challenge is is unclear in this letter. They could have been under persecution at the hand of the Roman rulers. It is a well-known fact that Roman emperors, particularly Nero, were not enthusiastic fans of the Christian community. Christians' unwillingness to pay homage to the emperors as gods drew the wrath of more than one Roman leader. Also, the Christian refusal to serve actively in the Roman army did little to endear their number to the political and military elite. Christian rituals... And Christian liturgical practices such as baptism and Holy Communion, these were viewed with suspicion and were thought to be distasteful by the Roman citizenry. Or the distress within the Philippi community could simply be internal dissent. Arguments within 
Christian communities, folks, is nothing new. Wherever two or more humans are gathered together, conflict may arise. Factionalism could definitely have been dividing the community of Philippi just as it was in Corinth. You got to remember that at this stage in the development of early Christianity, there was no canon to help guide these folks in their faith and in their conduct. Heresies and false teachers were constantly knocking at the door with a different sermon on the gospel. Jewish opponents of Paul denigrated the Christian faith. They refused to allow the believers, even the Jewish believers, to live in peace. So in the face of all these unsettling times, Paul is writing to the Philippians to encourage their faith and to bolster their courage. Live lives worthy of the gospel. Live lives worthy so that whether he is able to come and visit with them or he only is able to hear about them, he will be able to rest content that they are holding firm in the gospel that he brought to them. And by living such faithful lives, they are also showing their detractors that they are in no way intimidated or threatened. Just the opposite. By leading lives worthy of the gospel, they are displaying evidence of their salvation through the promise of Jesus Christ. Live lives worthy of the gospel. And this is great advice for us today. But what exactly does Paul mean by this injunction? What does it mean to live a life that is worthy of the gospel? Well, first, Paul means that they are to stand firm in one spirit. That is, they are to be united in their faith, presumably in their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord, the one who died for their salvation, and that through faith in him, we are forgiven of our sins And we are the recipients of eternal life with God. Later in the book of Philippians, Paul warns members of the church against persons preaching the necessity of circumcision or compliance with Jewish dietary laws. We see this if we look at chapter 3. These acts are not requirements for salvation. You do not have to follow these acts to get a seat at the table of our Lord. As Paul says elsewhere in his writings, we are saved by grace through faith, not by compliance to the law. Standing firm in one's spirit is living a life worthy of the gospel. Living a life worthy of the gospel also means to have interest in others to pay attention to the interest of others, to look to the interest of others, servanthood. Think about the lyrics to the song I read just a moment ago, how, I ser- how you serve, I'll serve. Servanthood is another way of living a life worthy of the gospel, whether we're talking about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples in the Gospel of John, or we're talking about the Good Samaritan who stops and helps the man who's been beaten and left for dead. Jesus preached over and over servanthood. I remember seeing a t-shirt one time. It had a slogan on it. It said, it's all about me. And you know, it may be cute, but that is definitely not living a life worthy of the Gospel. And finally, living a life worthy of the gospel means striving to become blameless and innocent. Wow. That's quite a challenge. To become blameless and innocent children of God. In our final interviews before the boards of ordained ministry, all candidates seeking full ordination in the United Methodist Church are asked several questions. One of those questions is, are you going on to perfection? Going on to perfection. Well, that could be a showstopper for some of us. Perfection? Perfection in what sense? I once met a member of one of my churches, and she was a PK, that is a preacher's kid. And she had grown up in the United Methodist Church, and 
around the understanding or the idea of perfection, or at least so I thought. But she was always so hard on herself and on everyone around her. And through our conversations, I began to realize that she didn't understand what perfection in this sense really meant. She truly believed that she was supposed to become this perfect human being, never making a mistake, never doing anything wrong, never failing at anything. And knowing that that's an impossible thing to reach, and yet feeling that she must attain it, had throughout her life caused her a lot of pain. But this is not what Christian perfection means. Now as we go along, we'll, we'll talk more about God's grace. But I just want to talk a little bit about it this morning. God's grace when we talk about that in the United Methodist Church, we talk about three stages of grace that we experience throughout our lives with God. There's prevenient grace, there's justifying grace, and then there's sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace is that ongoing work of the Holy Spirit within us that works to change us such that we conform to the mind of Christ. Now hear that again. Sanctifying grace is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit within each of us that works to change us such that we conform to the mind of Christ. It is where the divine image is restored. Now John Wesley referred to this as going on to perfection. Now this phrase often scares people and it frustrates others. When we hear it, it sounds either intimidating or pompous. But it doesn't mean that we're going to do everything perfectly. It doesn't mean that we will never make a mistake. What it does mean is that we are learning to love as God loves. This is the perfection that we are seeking. And it's a lifelong process. As Christian disciples, all of us should be striving to attain this goal, but I wonder how many of us will actually make it. You know, John Wesley, he felt that it was definitely possible to reach perfection as we live in this life. But he also felt that most people, including himself, would not reach Christian perfection as they live life on this earth. But still he believed that we should all be working toward that goal always. I hope we all remember that in this quest for perfection, though, we are not alone. When the candidates for ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church respond to this, and this is one of the historic questions, but when we respond to this, we answer, with God's help, we are going on to perfection. By the grace and the power of God, all of us are or should be going on to perfection and in this way, all of us are seeking to li live a life worthy of the gospel. Jim was headed down the highway to a conference when he noticed a farmer walking in the opposite direction down the median. Now, the man was striding purposefully along, and Jim was going, as I said, in the opposite direction. So he said, I saw the farmer walking along, and I inwardly wished him well and drove on past. But he said, then he came upon a pickup truck that had a flat tire along the side of the road, and that's when he realized that that farmer was going for help, and he also realized that he had about a three-mile walk to get to any help. He said, I realized that I couldn't just keep going, that I had to stop and turn around and go and help him. He said, locating a median crossover, I headed back, and the farmer accepted his offer for a ride. He drove him into the next town, and, and the farmer was able to set up uh, arrangements so that someone could come and help him with his flat tire. And Jim said, I'd invested about 30 minutes of my time and effort in this stranger, and now I would be a little late for my conference, but it was the right thing to do. And I'm glad I did it. 
Rarely are emergencies convenient. But if we're to give aid, if we're to give comfort, then we must make ourselves available when others need help. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 tells us to look out for one another. God ministers to others through us when we serve those in need. You know, what you do is what you believe. Everything else is just religious talk. To be blameless is to be pure. Purity is about intention. Is it our intention to serve others and to model a life worthy of the gospel? Paul tells us, let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others so that you may be blameless and innocent. When we seek to live out our lives in this way, then that's when we're moving on toward perfection. When we love or we strive to love as God loves, then we look to the interest of others and our lives focus on being servants of God. So how are you doing in your Christian discipleship? Are you looking to the interest of others? Are you seeking to move on toward perfection in your life? You know, when we're all willing to step out in faith and to live a life worthy of the gospel, when we're all willing to put in the difficult work of serving all of God's children, and when we are all standing before the pearly gates, and we are asked, have you tried to love as God loves? And we can all say, with God's help, we are going on to perfection. Then, my friends, that will be good news. Amen. This is our time of sharing prayers and praises. There are certainly many that are listed, which I dropped on our bulletin. And I hope that you use this every week. I hope that you take it home, that you read through these names in your own private time of prayers. Certainly God knows everything that is needed by these folks. God doesn't need us to tell what's going on. But it's that work together when we reach out to God that makes a difference. Prayer works. So let us lift these up. And I know that there are other names and situations that are weighing heavily upon your own hearts. And so let us go into a moment of silence and then we'll go to prayer together.
We come to you, O Great One, to renew our tired spirits. Let us rest in you a while and feel you surrounding us in safety and in love. It is our rest in you that calls forth new strength. For the weary, we pray for comfort and for peace. For the worried, we pray for solace and reassurance. For the desperate, we pray for relief and hope. Help us all to set our priorities differently so that you come before all other demands in our lives. For only then, we know, O God, may we be filled with your life once again to the fullest living on this earth. Grant us your peace, O God, as we come together praying as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we go into our time of offering, I want to remind us that all that we have, all that we see around us, all the blessings that we feel each and every day, those all belong to God. And so as we gather together and give ourselves and our gifts to God. Let us send up praises. Let us pray together. Our gracious God, how can we show our appreciation to you for the many ways that you have enriched our lives? When we look at what you have done for us, we are unsure how to adequately respond. By our faithful giving, we hope to give back to you a portion of our blessings in Christ's name. Amen.
Gracious God, we are so thankful for all our gifts. And Lord, we bring these gifts to you, representing all that we have and all that we are. Use us, Lord, in your service. Amen. words heard and sung and the spirit empower you to go forth and serve in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.